Hi, welcome to this very special edition uh, of Nominee New York State's E! News, where we're talking to uh, several of our models for our upcoming Off the Mask event, which is going to be taking place September 10th here in Albany. It's our third annual Off the Mask, where we encourage people to discuss their mental health and, and their experiences and share their stories as we're all experienced mental health challenges and many of us choose to not discuss these issues and mask our feelings. So we have our five of our incredible models, I guess six if you include me as well, as I'll be modeling again for my third time. And we're really encouraging, like I said, people to off their mask, tell their stories and help raise mental health awareness. So we have an incredible group here today. So I'm going to quickly introduce everybody and then we'll, we'll start uh, with our conversation. So just kind of going around the way I see you, we have uh, Brian Belt, Greg Hitchcock, Kristen Garzon, Daniel Kolnak, and, and Lacey Roy. So thank you all of you for joining us and, and not only you know, joining us today, but being a part of this really special event. We really appreciate it. And I kind of wanted to start by asking, why did you decide to become uh, an off the mask model and why is raising mental health awareness so important to you? Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, well, you know, one of the reasons, uh, the biggest reason uh, as to why I wanted to be involved with the off the mask event this year is um, first off, um, I wanted to be able to um, let uh, our nonprofit group, the Mental Health Awareness and Creative Arts Gallery, to be able to uh, showcase uh, some of their artwork, um, as well as you know, put together some nice masks. But the biggest reason I've I've been involved with NAMI for many, many, many years is my mother was helped considerably uh, through NAMI because um, I was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia in the year 2007. Um, and she struggled to emotionally handle what I was putting her through for so, so many years. And she found the support through NAMI of Columbia County um, to help guide her through, you know, how, how to handle it and, and what to do next. Um, so she's been really my biggest inspiration as to, you know, getting involved with NAMI. Um, in, the year 2010, I got involved with the recovery uh, through the PROSE program. And eventually, over time, I started to um, teach as a volunteer. Um, and I began to run a, a peer support group at the psychiatric unit at Columbia Memorial Hospital. And I had done that for almost nine years until the pandemic hit. Um, and I designed, developed, uh, a number of classes that I taught um, at the pros program as well. Um, and at this point, I'm a fully certified uh, um, peer recovery specialist. Um, and this last, you know, this, the, the uh, mental health awareness gallery came about um, a few years ago when I realized that, you know, I had all these connections in the mental health industry. I was, I had done a number of presentations for the NAMI of Columbia County. Um, and I was connected with all these peers over the years. And many of them like had uh, excellent artistic talent. Um, and one of my, you know, one of my uh, therapeutic tools has been digital artwork. So I sort of connected with all these artists that also had mental health recovery, uh, that also had mental health diagnoses. And 
I kind of brought them together and we ended up having four very successful exhibitions at Camp Hill Solaris. Um, I went about uh, going through doing the, uh, the paperwork and eventually this past year, we got our nonprofit status. So now we are a legal uh, 501c nonprofit. Um, and we also just recently got uh, at least a commercial space that we are going to open September 4th. So exciting um, right before the event. And, and you know, we'll be discussing more about the, the art and the program in a bit, but yeah, yeah. what really amazes me about you, you know, the, the similarities in our stories is, is our moms. And, you know, I, I say this all the time, everything I've learned about advocacy, I learned from my mom advocating for me when I was diagnosed with ADD when I was three and a half years old. And then when I became, when I was 17 years old, my mom uh, had a nervous breakdown, was diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder, which is now diagnosed as straight to borderline personality. And I had to advocate for her. And I say all the time, Brian, like what you mentioned, I wish when my mom got sick that there was, I knew about NAMI and that there was the supports there for us. And it amazes me all that she did with uh, without having NAMI. But that, I think that's one of the real reasons we're doing Off the Mask is sometimes we say, NAMI is the best kept secret in town. And this is such a great opportunity to let people know that help, hope, support, and education is out there. So thank you so much, Brian. So I'm gonna now turn to Lacey. Uh, Lacey, why is uh, raising mental health awareness and participating in the event important to you? Oh, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I chose to accept the model request to present NAMI Syracuse on the runway in Albany mainly because we talk about mental health and this abstract concept of wellness and illness and labels. And it's very easy to feel detached or disassociated from, forget that we're humans, we're individuals, we have lives, we're moms, we're business owners, students, all ages, all shapes, all sizes. And so it's a, a very easy answer to say, oh, you need me to talk about this publicly? Sure, and put a face to it. Well, thank you. I'm really looking forward to talking more about your journey in a little bit. Um, Danielle, how about you? Why, why did you decide to be an off the mask model and raise mental health awareness? Um, I didn't realize and know that I had a problem until I realized I had a problem. And a lot of people like myself don't realize that we have something going on, there's a reason why we are going to other things to mask what we have going on. Um, so that being said, I thought it was really important because I didn't know that I had, I, I had an issue and I had a, a problem because I was masking it with, you know, street drugs and pharmaceuticals. Um, and it's really important. And I know so many people that struggle with this and they don't even realize that it's something deeper than what they, they know it is to be. Yeah, I really appreciate that you said that, Danielle. You know, I have a close family member too who uh, suffered from mental health issues and, and masked uh, their, their issues through, through drugs. And, you know, they had had a neck injury and was prescribed yeah. painkillers and that turned into a, a real addiction once they, yeah. they realized they were really treating their anxiety and not the pain. And, it was a very oh, scary correct. journey. So it's, you know, it's a whole different, you know, we're talking about off in our masks, but you know, that's a whole different mask that people put on. So I'm so glad it, you correct. mentioned that. It's a whole, everybody's mask is different. Everybody's mask is different. And everyone's mask is real. It's legit. Yeah. It's a real mask. No, yeah, well, thank you for mentioning that. Um, Greg, You're welcome. Uh, why did you decide to become a, an off the mask model and raise awareness? Well, when I heard about the opportunity, I thought that um, I'm not the correct person to be a model and run the wrong runway and stuff. And, you know, I'm oversized. I, I'm a little heavy on the heavy side. But then, <laughs> but, but then I read this book by, uh, by the founders of No Barriers USA, and it's called What's Within You. 
And inside, there's an inspiring story about this woman who's oversized and um, one of the plus sizes. And uh, she had a hard time growing up um, with her image. And uh, she self-purged and stuff and, and self-mutilated herself until she found out she could dance. So she put on this video uh, as a dancer. And even though she was oversized still, there were like millions of followers on her YouTube channel. So that got me the idea that it's not, it's not, it's people have to be accept themselves from all shapes and sizes. And they also have to accept themselves, uh, be comfortable with their own skin. So that's why I also wanted to uh, be in part of this mental health awareness event, because it's not who, it's not, it's not what you do, it's who you are. So that's one of the inspiring stories that I, I want to instill in people. So thanks, Matthew. No, thank you. And I'm so glad you shared that. And I'm also obviously a, a part of the plus size community. And, and <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of times men have a hard time talking about our body image. And that's something I've always struggled with as well. I've always been a husky kid, if you, if you will, or, what, you know, always uncomfortable with my body. And, and like I said, this is my third year doing the off the mask modeling. And that first year, it was such an empowering feeling to, to you know, uh, conquer those feelings that I've had, that uncomfortability I had with my own body image and, and to get out there and, and this is me, you know, I am what I am and, and we're all beautiful in our own way. So I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And then I'm so glad our uh, plus size community will be represented. And especially <laughs> mental health issues, you know, a lot of times medication that they're on cause you know overweight and things like that and they don't you know aren't comfortable with themselves and you know it takes all types of people to do this so I'm, I'm so glad you touched upon that and I think that's a mask that a lot of men put on and, and they don't like talking about their body image I remember going to Weight Watchers and there'd be maybe me and one other guy there so I'm so glad you mentioned that and uh hey, ma'am so why did you choose to participate for the third year running? <laughs> well, for several reasons. Um, you know, obviously, not. I, I work for NAMI, and, and it's been, uh, you know, just an incredible experience, an incredible blessing for me. Like I said, you know, I've been dealing with my own mental health issues for over 40 years since I was three and a half years old. My family has been impacted by this. And, you know, it's really not a job for me. It, it's a mission. And, and you know, to inspire others and to really raise awareness. And like I said earlier to Brian, and make sure that, you know, I wish my family knew there was NAMI out there when we were struggling with me and with my mom. And I don't want anyone to experience what my family experienced. So thank you for asking, Lacey. I appreciate it. <laughs> and it, it's been an incredible experience. And uh, I keep coming back. They can't get rid of me. So uh, it's, uh, it's just a really powerful event. So. Um, finally, I just want to ask Kristen, why are you uh, participating and why is this important to you? Um, so I'm really honored to be a part of this group um, this year. It will be my first year. Um, I have suffered from depression and anxiety since I was 21 when I was diagnosed, probably well before then. And I, I was diagnosed and had to seek help after a very traumatic experience. Um, but I hid my my battle with mental health and mental illness for a very long time up until I was 30 when um, my daughter was seven months old and I was suffering heavily from postpartum depression, which I didn't know at the time. And one of my best friends took her own life at um, nine months postpartum um, and losing her really just kind of was a jarring experience that changed my life forever. And that's when I kind of decided that I needed to um, take off my mask, so to speak, and kind of share in the open who I was and the more liberated, the more liberating that process um, became, the more people spoke up and they shared their own stories and it helped me fully become who I am. I still really suffer. Um, I still really have good days and bad days. Today's actually a really bad day for me, but you know, you show up kind of and you get to talk about what you really want everybody else to be a part of and to share. So it makes it all worthwhile. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here, especially on your bad days. And thank you for sharing that because, you know, that's such an important thing. It's something we talk about all the time too, is like, especially now more than ever, a lot of times people are so programmed to say that they're okay, right? That's their mask. We got this kind of 
undefined social contract. I ask you how you are, you're, you know, kind of trained responses to say that you're okay. That's what we do. People have a hard time saying they're not okay today. And, and to be honest, so I really appreciate you taking off that mask right away. And I also, to get into some of our deeper questions, I'm really glad that you brought up, you know, the work that you're doing with postpartum depression. I give you so much credit for that because it's something that a lot of women, I think, are uncomfortable discussing. Even if they've experienced it, they see it, they don't really understand it or see it as a, so some sort of failure as them being a mother or not being a good parent, where it is a real condition that's treatable like anything else. And I think there needs to be so much awareness on this. And I know you've really taken it upon yourself with the book of KNT Foundation um, that you started. Can you talk about this and what the foundation does and, and how you're helping to raise awareness about this very important issue? Yeah, so um, it basically started, like I said, um, I lost one of my best friends, Kristen Nicole Thorsten, which is, I believe, KNT, um, when I was seven months postpartum, and it kind of changed my life. Um, it, people around me started to kind of understand a little bit more what postpartum depression was. I started to understand what postpartum depression was more um, because just like mental health there, or mental illness, there is a stigma behind postpartum depression because you think that somebody has a baby and it's supposed to be their mo the most happiest moment of their life and everything should be, you know, rainbows and butterflies. Um, my best friend, Kristen, she was I guess the poster child, you would think for the perfect mom. I mean, this beautiful woman who just loved her daughter dearly, but just had a really, you know, struggled. She was bipolar and had some mental issues um, that we all do. Um, so in the past couple of years, I've tried to advocate as much as I could. And then I kind of took it big picture and really took the big leap um, this past January of creating a non-for-profit in her honor, the Believe KNT. Foundation, where we raise funds um, to try to make healthcare or mental health care available for any and all mothers in the United States. Um, so we're pretty much up and running now. We're almost up and running with our website. We've raised almost $7,000 to date. Um, and I'm really looking forward to giving that back to providers that are around the U.S. that could use that um, money to help a mother that may not be able to have the the money or the insurance and able to to help um, that certain person out. So it's really become something that has um, become something so close to my heart and postpartum depression awareness has really become um, something that I love to kind of talk about. So wow, and you know that really is the epitome of the NAMI spirit. I, I say this all the time. I think the greatest thing that NAMI can give our members and the people who participate in our programs is that. We use, learn to use our struggles and our painful experiences as a gift because we, we understand them and we use it to help others. So these, these very challenging experiences that we've had aren't for nothing and, and that we can use them to help others. So no one has to walk in our footsteps, kind of the answer I, I was telling Lacey before that, you know, I never want anyone to experience what my family experienced. I want to make it better. So just thank you for doing that. It, it's so inspirational. Thank and I know you. you really consider yourself a mental health warrior and you use both your Instagram account mm -hmm. as well as your activities as a marathoner and a 50 mile ultra marathoner <laughs> as a way to raise awareness and funds. And I know you have an event coming up in September as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, with my depression and anxiety and then through my postpartum depression, I'd always use running as a tool um, as a therapy tool. Um, so then when I started kind of figuring out and started talking in the open about these topics that I was going through, I started to use running as a way to raise money and awareness for these um, particular topics. I've run a lot for Every Mother Counts. Now, a lot of the funds that I'll be running for will be for the Believe KNT Foundation. Um, fitness has been just a thing that has helped me um, tremendously aside from taking you know, daily medications and going to therapy um, bi-weekly. But um, there is a local gym who is very close to my heart, Anatomy. They are right in East Green or North Greenbush, New York. Um, and they are donating their time. We're doing a ride for mental health and uh, move for mental health, which will be a hit class. And they're taking donations for that. And that will be September 4th. Um, it's a Saturday. 
at 8 a.m. Um, you don't have to be a member of anatomy um, to attend. Um, there is a wait list for the ride portion already, um, just because of there's not enough bikes. Um, but for the move portion, um, it is open. So, you know, I encourage anyone who wants to move for a good cause to join us on that Saturday. It's a really great group. And I know that they fully supported me and have kept me, you know, in high spirits on the days that I needed it the most. So that's awesome. If people want to learn more, your Instagram is it is at Melon K. So it's M-E-L-L-A-N-K. That's my maiden name, um, Melon and then K. So I appreciate it. Oh, well, we appreciate you and everything you're doing, Kristen. Thank you. So Thank you. Lacey, I want to turn to you. And, and you know, I know you've done a lot of work for our NAMI Syracuse affiliate and served on their board, but what I really admire about you is that you've also taken matters into your own hands and, and filled a void. You, know, you saw a void and you filled it, which I just give you so much credit. And, and you created this support group for individuals who live with a mental illness, which focuses on capabilities because of people's symptoms versus most of the type of support groups which focus only on what's wrong and overcoming those challenges as sort of a an area of less than. So can you kind of describe this philosophy and, and the experiences you've had with the group? Sure, absolutely. It is my absolute pride and joy. Um, I had bipolar symptoms for 10 years and I had been told by a psychiatrist, well-meaning and well-intended, I'm sure, although I don't view it that way, that I needed to lower my expectations and well, maybe we should consider a different career path, whatever, on and on. And um, I listened to this person for a little bit and I realized you don't know who the F I am and I'll show you and started devouring any information I could of other people who are doing big things with big challenges, whether it's mental illness or physical challenges, whatever the case. And I read a book that changed, it affirmed and validated my perception of myself. And it was, um, oh, Jesus, are you kidding me right now? Give me a second. I have all the books here. Oh, A First Rate Madness. It's like right over my shoulder. And it, it details very, very famous people. Um, John F. Kennedy, Abraham Lincoln. Martin Luther King. I've actually read that book. I am a huge fan of that book. Oh, right? It's like required reading for anyone who's in my circle. And uh, it basically is a very well researched, uh, highly regarded psychiatrist. And usually psychiatrists are not friends of those of us on the receiving end um, in terms of we need to fix you. It's like, no, we don't. I don't understand why I'm fitting into your society. You should fit into my society because I can do big things because of what I have. And after reading that book and being extremely validated on my belief, I realized because I had um, hypomanic tendencies, I could do things like this. If I adopted different ways of doing things, if I didn't try to fit in and be normal, I was completely fine and golden. I needed my own way. Um, and that meant having different ways of doing business and having different business cycles. And it really forced me, like you said, these very odd gifts end up being the best gifts. And I realized every time I went to a support group for those, these moments when I was just like, oh my God, this is crazy amounts of pressure as a financial advisor. I'm a mom. I was a single mom forever. Um, and even though I'm considered high functioning, it doesn't mean it's because anything's lesser. It's just because I am working so freaking hard to do my own thing. I'm able to fit in society in a different way. I hate that label. And I realized I cannot be the only person with one foot in two different worlds. And I really just very self-centeredly, and I am very open to that because I don't think it's a bad thing, wanted to surround myself with other people who also were starting to figure out, wait a minute, anxiety means I have a really great imagination. I see a different perspective. I can prepare in ways that other people can't prepare. Oh, wait a minute. Like I have, I have depression. So that means my realism is a whole different way in perspective than others. And I bring something very valuable to businesses and life and society. If they let me share that gift, if I can see that gift. And, uh, so 
kind of knocked on NAMI Syracuse's door. It took me about a, a year of not giving up because I kept being told by other people, like, there's so many support groups. I'm like, but there isn't one like this. We're doing it. And basically um, was like, yeah, so we're meeting here on this day because I know we have nothing going on and you can't tell me no. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's the I, red I hair. I don't know. <laughs> And, and, that, and that determination, I mean, that's obviously such an important part of recovery. And I can talk about that. I mean, we could do a whole episode just uh, on that book. But, you know, one of the things that, and one of the things that I just really remember for the book, they, they focus on um, Ulysses S. Grant at one point, too, who was a, a, and Sherman in the Civil War, you know, two people who struggled outside of, of war and, and, and being president, like failed businesses and things like that. But they're because they didn't fit into that conventional box, but their unique way of thinking and, and their symptoms is what made them such great generals and, and seeing things in a different yeah. way. And, and that book yeah. is so inspiring to me too. So it's, I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's insanity. And uh, Jim Levy has taken over for me. I didn't feel comfortable since it's a peer support group. Mm -hmm. Once we discovered that um, my bipolar symptoms aren't actually because of mental illness, it was a it was a blood disorder, um, the way I metabolized iron that was causing very textbook symptoms. I asked him to take over to keep the feel of the group and he's been phenomenal. They have uh, themes every month that they go through and is basically teaching others how to see themselves. Cause when it comes down to it, and I keep saying we, cause there's still parts of me that if I'm not careful, those symptoms come back. Um, we aren't burdens we aren't pains in the asses. We aren't, we're just different. And I, I had this huge thing inside my company about don't tell me to fit this mold that I didn't agree to play by. Mm -hmm. so I'm really proud that they've kept that going. That's awesome. And the other thing that I think is so important and really tying into off the mask, what you say, you know, you thought you had bipolar disorder, but it, it wasn't, it was a blood disorder, but you don't, you know, I, I say this all the time, a label, a disease label, something you tell the insurance company to get your, your services covered. And you don't need to have a specific diagnosis to face mental health challenges. We all face mental health challenges. And, you know, that's, you know, too many people face these challenges and don't want to talk about it. And, and that's what we're trying to change. And I know one of the other really cool things that you've done, both to raise funds for Off the Mask and to, um, you know, raise awareness is by hosting like a mental health symposium a couple of weeks ago. And I know uh, you're going to be doing another one in a couple of weeks. Can you talk about that a little bit and what that experience was like? Yeah. So I am, as one can imagine, super passionate about parody and <laughs> mental health to physical health because mental health is physical health. Like it boggles my mind the that there's a medical community who's like, no, it's different. Uh, but basically, September 15th, upcoming, um, it's all virtual, so anywhere else. We're titling it, Shut Up, 10 Years of Bipolar Undone Overnight. And it's myself uh, representing Full Body Health and being very open and raw about uh, 10 years of bipolar one is how I was repeatedly diagnosed, uh, including being involuntarily committed to a psych ward and losing careers, the whole thing, hearing voices, my kids growing up uh, with a mom who was bipolar and literally overnight gone. My symptoms are just done as soon as I started treatment and having to relearn myself and how to, how to um, be because everything about me and how I interacted was, was thrown off and changed overnight. And it was a $15 test that caught it by an endocrinologist who just happened to ask a question. And so uh, Dr. Sherry now from Govia Wellness in Rochester, New York, um, she has a different type of um, medical mental health facility. We're going to have a very raw conversation about what that was like, her perspective, hearing the very traditional ways I was treated and how to keep it from happening from other people. And it's not this crazy top down, although that would be nice, mm -hmm. but these simple things that we can do either advocating for ourselves or advocating for family members to really make sure before we take 10 years of very complicated meds and 
situations that we know actually what's going on. I'm very excited about that. Well, thank you, Lacey. And I know, uh, uh, turn to Greg, because there's a lot of parallels in your stories. I, I think it's really interesting. So, you know, Greg, where Lacey was just talking about, you know, approaching recovery from an angle of really embracing your capabilities and not kind of taking this less than mentality. And what inspires me about you, Greg, is that you're kind of the epitome of this notion as well. I mean, you were honorably discharged from the army after being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And I think for many people that would have derailed them and, and sent them on a very negative path, not to say that your path was, has been easy, but you really used this as an opportunity as, as you went back home and entered college. And this has led to this incredible career that you've had as a very accomplished filmmaker and a writer. And, a, and I think one of the things that makes you so good as a storyteller is the empathy that you've developed during your own recovery journey. Can you kind of discuss a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, well, Matthew, it's a good question he asked. Um, I want to let you know that uh, it hasn't been easy. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia while I was in the service in the Army, and uh, I had to do a, a, the road recovery like everybody else has um, has done or is continuing to do so for some people. And uh, But I want to share, I, as an English major, I want to share a, a little bit, a quote from Robert Frost, one of my favorite poets. And it says, I should be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. The road, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So in his poem, I think he's talking about two roads in life. So I, I was getting ready to serve my, serve, serve my country in the army and then I got derailed. So I had to take another road. Um, and this made me uh, more um, introspective because I had this mental illness I was dealing with. And when I got into journalism, I sort of like uh, talked to lots of people, interviewed lots of people in, in all walks of life, in all situations like uh, fires, floods, uh, you know, um, uh, political corruption, scandals, uh, legal court cases and stuff like that. And not only listen to them, but I had to write it down for other people that didn't know these stories as accurately as I could. Um, so that gave me a, a, a good sense of, of listening to people and empathizing with people. And through that, both my mental health recovery and my career as a journalist and filmmaker, it made me more empathetic towards other people, not, not sympathetic, but empathetic. One of the things that um, I had to do um, is not react to things. I had to act on things. Reacting and, and acting upon things are totally different. You react on something when something happens to you, but you have to be the catalyst of your own life. And you have to uh, uh, accept some risks. Like uh, last week, I was in a rock climbing trip in New Hampshire. And it's a bunch of veterans and us and some staff people. And we had to process what we did for rock climbing. And I told everybody about my experiences and when I was getting out of the service and dealing with my mental illness. And I always wanted to say that in the beginning, I wanted to be average like everybody else. I want to have the car, I want to have the house, I want to have the career, but it's not like that. I, I just discovered myself that, um, and everybody agreed. Uh, the slogan that we came up with was average sucks, be you. So that's, I that's that. what I, and I, I do love the, the Robert Frost quote that you had. And I talk about this all the time. I, I think too often we compare ourselves to other people and don't compare ourselves to us. And, and everyone has their own path. And, it, you know, the quote that I use all the time and that kind of goes to that, it, it's one of my favorite quotes is from the Grateful Dead, the song Ripple. And there is a road, no simple highway between the dawn and the dark of night. If you should go, no one should follow. That path is for your steps alone. And I tell that to people all the time, you know, I have friends that, you know, got out of college and immediately were successful. I struggled for 10 years and that's okay because I've come to realize that that 10 year struggle has made me so good at my job at NAMI. And I'm, I'm so glad you discussed that because we all have our own sets of challenges. We all have our roads and we can't compare anyone else's road to ours. And, and we're all different. So, so thank you. Exactly. So much. Matthew. 
<laughs> and one of the other things that, you know, we, we've known each other for a long time and that I really admire about you, Greg, is that you want to be known as someone living with schizophrenia and be a role model and an advocate for others living with a mental illness. And why is that so important to you? I, it goes back to my other hero, Nelson Mandela. He said, uh, the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, but having to rise every time we fail. So um, he's, he's a role model. And I think that uh, your question about um, wanting to be a role model for other people, it speaks about that because uh, we fall all the time, but we all, always have to rise up. And some of my people that I that helped me rise up were mentors. I remember uh, when I was in the army, uh, one of my mentors uh, when I was dealing with my symptoms was Mr. Mumford. He he was a really good guy, and uh, he helped me understand my illness when I was happening to me. I tried to hide it, but he he helped me. And um, throughout my career as a journalist and filmmaker, I always want to portray people recovering from something like uh i'm doing two fundraisers uh for uh off the mask and there are two screenings of uh, my documentary a 30-minute documentary that i'm doing about the haudenosaunee the iroquois in, uh, indigenous people that live in the mohawk valley and uh it's going to be in johnstown and in troy um Johnstown, can I say that, Matthew? Can I tell him what's Of course, going on? please. I was going to ask you, so you beat me to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's about the indigenous people, the Iroquois that lived in the Mohawk Valley and their struggles with discrimination, stigma, and um, and racism. And uh, that has something to do with uh, the myth, myth, mental illness and that stigma that we face as well. And uh, one of the screenings is going to be at the Johnstown Public Library in Fulton County on Tuesday, September 7th at 5 o'clock. And the other one will be the next day, September 8th at 6 o'clock at the Troy Public Library in Troy, New York. And I'm trying to raise money for, for this off the mask, just asking for donations, but it's free admission. So everybody can come in and enjoy themselves and, and uh, experience what it's like to be an Indigenous person. Yeah, it's such an important topic as those community, and we just had a uh, a panel with Indigenous people and, and Native Americans. It's so important. I'm really looking forward to coming out on uh, the eighth at the uh, the Troy Public Library and seeing you and seeing the film. So, thank you so much, and, and thank I, I think being a role model too and being a face of somebody with schizophrenia is so important because. Out of all the mental health disorders, I think that's the one that's most misunderstood and. and showing that you can live a productive, healthy life. I know Brian is the same way and, and, and just such an inspiration. So thank you, thank you for that. It, it's so important and uh, you're really, I know, inspiring many others. So um, I wanna to turn to Danielle. Um, first, Danielle, I, I wanna thank you for the work that you do as a certified nurse's assistant, you know, um, and and in you know and everyone in the medical field right now, or I mean, are, are being recognized as the heroes that you are. And thank you. Oh no, thank you. And you know, <laughs> one of the things we've already discussed is, is how open you are in discussing your sobriety. And I, I give you so much credit for discussing the ability of how to let go and how that's instrumental for maintaining your sobriety. I think that's certainly an ability that's uh, important to everyone these days with everything we're struggling yeah. with, especially in the medical field. So can you kind of discuss this notion of letting go and why that's so important to you and, and to your sobriety and mental health? I guess for me personally, letting go was accepting the things I cannot change accepting what I cannot control and accepting things for what they are and people for who they are. Um, because I ha I struggled with acceptance, if that makes sense. Yeah. I struggled with acceptance from others at a young age, always worried because I was, you know, like yourself, I was a chubby kid, you know, I wasn't like, they weren't screaming my names in the hallways, you know. So just trying to be accepted, really, I didn't realize how not important it was. I, I'm an only child. I have no siblings, as far as younger siblings growing up, it was just me. 
um, I do have siblings, but they're from my, my, my father and they're younger than me. I'm the oldest of the siblings that I do have. Um, so it was just me and my mom and just trying to fit in. You, it's so important as a, a young child to fit in. You want to fit in. And I guess it, it really took a toll on me and where I thought I fit in hurt me. <laughs> I didn't fit in. Um, and now that I'm 38, it's amazing to be able to accept me for me. And if you don't want to, you know, jump on my bus, fine. You don't have to. But you don't have to be rude and you don't have to discriminate and you don't have to say, well, this isn't right or you don't, you know, that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. But I, I'm not going to let that. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm not going to let that. I can't find the word. I think it starts with a D, but I, nope, I'm not. It's well, like, I'm not going to let that be who put that on me. You. Define me. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to let that define me anymore. Um, nice. And yeah, and it's, it's a core thing. It's really like, you got to really have a lot of self-reflection, a lot of just accepting we as who we are. Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and like I said, I was first diagnosed at three and a half years old after I was actually expelled from preschool for being oh, hyperactive. Geez. And and no, it, it's a true story. And but you wow. know, you get that label at three and a half years old, yeah. and it's something I've struggled with my whole life, feeling different than others and knowing that I was different than others. And, and you know, right. in some ways I do, you know, I've come to embrace my differences and don't let them I've let them define me in a more positive way. And I, I think right, that's exactly. so important. That, that's, and that's, that's, that's important that. because there's people who say, we're amazing. There's, I mean, all the people, you know, we choose who we want around us. If I no longer put myself in positions where if I know it's not good or I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. If I'm not comfortable, I'm not going to do it. You know, I just, I have to learn when to just call the shots and know what's in my best mental interest. That, that's, that's so true. And, and you know, it's something that I think everyone needs to learn. And I know one of the other things that you do to kind of raise awareness and to kind of help people is that you create charms that I know are going to be included in the VIP yes. bags at the event. But can you tell us a little bit more about that and how people can get uh, one of them or order them? Sure. Can I actually tell you just a small, sure. a small story behind where they came from? The idea. Sure, My daughter was throwing, she was getting rid of um, one of her charm kits. Uh, it was like a little jewelry keychain making kit or something. And I, and I was like, well, let's, there's, it's still good. Let's, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stash it away, you know, whatever. Maybe some friends will come over. We can play with it. You know, it was still good. So during my sobriety, I started playing with them. <laughs> and then I started picking up things that I love. I heard, you know, doing childlike things that make you happy or good. I started coloring. Then I started roller skating again. And I bought all my kids roller skates. We started roller skating. I was like, ah, it was awesome. Then I started making charms for my roller skates, me and my kids. And I and so that's where the charms came from. Then they then I started making sneaker charms. Then they went from sneaker charms to purse charms. And then I made charms to attach to my ring for, and it turned in, and it helped me for my anxiety. So it turned into something that actually ended up really helping me outside of the house. For some reason, I'm really awkward in lines at the store. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I'm just standing here. I like to move. And I found myself fidgeting with them. I found myself fidgeting with my charms in my car, on the phone. Like, it was just, it was amazing because it actually helped me not focus on everything else that was around me. And I was playing with my charm that I absolutely love because it's pretty. So it was helping with my anxiety. And then I made faith charms for whatever you believe in, which I thought was amazing. And I wanted to partner or find a sober house that people graduate from and they leave for some of the women so they could have a nice parting gift to remember, don't give up, you know, you, 
look how far you've come. You have to have faith. People believe in you. You know, it, it's just the part. I have a lot of great ideas and I'm just kind of doing it. <laughs> and I think it's awesome. And I really believe in it because I've never heard anything of it. And it, and it really does help me. It really does. And the people that I've sent them out to, they 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 like them as well. So, oh, that's fantastic! And I know but, um, in the email that, that's going to come out with this the video, there'll be a link to how to get the charms. I know in order form, and uh, and again, you can get them by attending the event and getting a VIP ticket, and and a link for that will be yes. in the email as well. So. Thank you so much, Danielle, for all that you're doing. And I know Absolutely. we're short on time, so I want to make sure we focus on Brian. You know, it just amazes me talking to all of you guys, the the, the stories that you have, and, and you've all lived such incredible lives. And, and Brian is kind of like our ringer for the fashion show here, because part of his story is that he was formerly a professional model in Switzerland, which must have been some, <laughs> of, some experience. So, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, well, it, uh, it was uh, 1989, and um, I uh, was with my girlfriend in Paris at that time, um, and we we'd been together uh, since I had graduated from New York University uh, uh, School of the Arts. And she broke up with me for the fifth time. I, I guess I was a, a sucker for love uh, at that age. But um, she broke up with me and I didn't have any money. I didn't have any way to get back to the States. Uh, I did have a guitar um, that I could play a little bit. And I had enough money to... Uh, well, no, I didn't have any money, but I, I got on the subway there in Paris and uh, started playing for change to get cherries and bread. Um, and then um, out of the blue, one day, uh, some fellow came up and said, would you like to model in in Switzerland? Um, I, I'll, I'll give you a free ticket to uh, Zurich, Switzerland. You just have to show up at the airport. So I was like, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, whatever, right? I mean, I didn't, you know, I was like down on my luck. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just show up at the airport if there's a ticket, then cool. Then sure enough, there was a ticket and I ended up flying to Zurich and um, I stayed overnight at some fellow's house in uh, Switzerland, Zurich, Switzerland, and then um, got um, hired um, as a model through option model agency. And um, yeah, there's still some pictures of me here. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. Old pictures. Yeah, how old are you then? Oh, did you say just uh, in my 20s? Well? In my 20s. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, was that an empowering experience for you? Was it empowering? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it was empowering so much. I mean, you know, in the in the model world, or at least at that time, you know, it was kind of, you know, you were celebrated for your looks. Right. You know, not your ideas or mm -hmm. anything else. Um, so, but I, you know, I did have fun. You know, I, I can only imagine. I mean, what are around. you? Incredible story from going to they, playing they, for they, change one day to literally modeling the next. I mean, it's, uh, it's yeah. really some story. It, it was is also at the height of the AIDS epidemic, mm. um, and at that time, um, Zurich uh, had a decriminalization policy, so they opened up what is called a uh, drug park, Needle Park, mm. um, and. They would give out um, clean needles to addicts to prevent the spread of AIDS. Um, and I did, at that time, I did dabble in that because it was sort of like, oh, well, all these people are hanging out on this island and they're shooting up heroin and cocaine. And 
and um, I, I I did it too. Um, but um, I got you know kind of caught up in the bad end of things there, you know, along with the modeling because it was like easy money on one end, and then you had all these other temptations on the other end, and then everyone telling you how fabulous you were, even though you know all you were basically was just pretty a pretty boy <laughs> uh, it's interesting and so, then, yeah. uh, anyway i i ended up my i think my parents ended up showing show, showing up at some point you know said you know you need to get out of here <laughs> this is bad news for you uh, we'll probably so I, I ended up I, I, yeah when i when i left after um several months or whatever i, I think i went to uh, my first rehab started uh uh, substance, uh, substance use recovery. Yeah. There's so many overlapping bit. stories here, yeah. obviously, like yeah, Danielle's. And, I don't know. I, you know, I did it again or whatever. Well, I'm glad we could give you a, a, a safe space um, to go back and, and model and, and raise, you know, do it for I'm good and, and celebrate everything else, all your other skills, because you really are uh, a bit of a renaissance man you, you mentioned right. music before and of course at the start we talked about how important art has been both you know vi your, the digital art that you do as well as uh, the incredible work that you're doing as president of the mental health awareness and creative arts gallery and i know um the gallery is going to be contributing work for the off the mask uh, off um art exhibit excuse me so can you kind of tell us about the gallery and and how that's helped other people and the importance of art in recovery the gallery, you know, concept behind it, you know, was always similar to NAMI, is, is how do we eliminate the stigma as it relates to mental health disorders? Because stigma is probably the biggest barrier for people to seek recovery. It was for me. I, for years, did not talk. I had a therapist. I did not talk about my thought process because I was dead terrified I was going to be put in a psych ward for the rest of my life. So I shut up and then I found ways to get out of the country or go here or go there, get out, get out, get out, but it never worked. So I, I eventually, eventually built up some trust to um, speak openly to my therapist. But the, the concept behind the gallery is public disclosure of your mental health disorder story. And with the backdrop of artwork um, by people um, that also have mental health diagnosis disorders. Um, some of them are very open about their recovery, their, their mental health struggles. Um, some are just willing to have their work displayed in the, the gallery, but they, they support the goal and the vision of the gallery. So, and we're located in a very prominent space in, in Hudson, New York, and when we do open, we're going to reshape how people think on mental health disorders. It's so exciting. And, and I'm so glad that we're going to be able to uh, you know, follow up that opening on uh, September 4th with the, uh, you know, including some of the artists and their stories, because it, it's so important, like you said, it's just such a great way to not just raise awareness, but but you know, break down the stigma and everyone here. I mean, what an incredible group. I mean, I, I could talk to you guys all day and, and all of you have such wonderful stories and it's, it's been so great learning about what you're doing and, and getting to know you and, and having you a part of the NAMI family. And then as we say all the time at NAMI New York State, hope starts with you and, and each of you are just such an incredible example of that in your own unique ways, although we see, you know, some commonalities in our stories, but each of you, uh, you know, no one's average here, as we were kind of talking before, average sucks, and you're all unique, and you're all, 
really so inspirational. So thank you for sharing your stories, sharing your talents and, and, and being a part of this event. I can't wait to meet you all in person and uh, hit the runway together again on September 10th, Albany, 60 State Place. Uh, tickets are now available. Come join us for this incredible evening. Get to meet these incredible models. Get to see some of the amazing art that Brian is helping um, bring to the forefront. It's going to be an inspiring evening, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much.